Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. And we'll be having our first trainee, first trainee Zoom presentation. My name is Ki Bei, and I will be, I am a CDTLP trainee and trainee co-lead for the CDTLP education and training pro, uh, program. I'll be facilitating today's session. For the next hour and a half, we'll hear from the next generation of donation and transplantation researchers, uh, CDTLP trainees, and other graduate students from across Canada who are presenting their research in a three-minute thesis format. So for today's session, we'll be focusing on basic science and trainees from CDTLP themes three and four. And each trainee will have three minutes of presentation and with a two minute question and answer period. The, and for the best part, you get to evaluate each presentation. The three best presentations will receive a $250 award and the winners will be announced during the dinner celebration tomorrow. Please use the QR code in the sessions program to access the anonymous scoring guide. And for our virtual participants, Manuel Escoto will be presenting the link to the chat and will be bringing your questions to the presenter. Each presentation will be evaluated on comprehension and content, which includes presentation providing a clear background and significance to the research questions, and presentation clearly describing the research strategy and design, as well as the research results and findings. The presentation must clearly describe the conclusion, outcomes, and impact of research. And you will also be evaluated on engagement and communication, which includes or, uh, orientation, which delivered clearly, and language, which is appropriate for non-science audience. The PowerPoint slide will be well-defined and enhance the presentation. The presenter convey enthusiasm for their research and captured and maintain the audience's attention. And for these, it will be evaluated on a scale of one to five, with one being the poor and five being excellent. So with that, we'll also follow with a survey of the presentation. And I'll be handing this over to Aisha Adele, our first presenter, who is a master's student at the Institute of Medical Science at the University of Toronto, who is presenting on the topic of ex vivo perfusion, D and resterilization of rat hind limbs for vascular composition out of transplantation. So welcome, Aisha Adele. When someone has traumatic injuries or surgery to remove cancer, it, they can have substantial tissue to loss that is difficult to reconstruct. While you can take one part of your tissues from one part of your body to repair the injured part in plastic surgery, that's not enough for large tissue loss. One option is to transplant multiple tissues containing multiple different types, skin, muscle, nerve, vessels, bone, Altogether is one unit from a donor to a recipient. This is called vascular composite allotransplantation or VCA. However, VCA is limiting because it requires the use of lifelong anti-rejection drugs that can be toxic, lead to increased risk for infections and cancers. Today, I'll introduce the use of a bioengineering method to help circumvent that challenge. The bioengineering technique shown here involves taking a donor tissue, removing cells while maintaining the three-dimensional structure of it called decellularization, and then repopulating it with recipient-specific cells that could tailor the transplant to the patient receiving it, called recellularization. Next. My, the goal of my project is to establish this bioengineering technique in the rat hind limb um, to establish a proof of concept model. Using a perfusion bioreactor, I'm able to pass a detergent that can then keep the limb intact but remove cells. Using the system, we were able to obtain a scaffold that contained no cells, but had each of its tissue compartments intact. When I looked at the skin, muscle, nerve, vessels, and bone, the tissue structure remained, but no cell nuclei could be detected. To attempt the recellularization component of this, I reinserted endothelial cells and muscle cells into the vessel and muscle tissue, respectively. After 24 hours of culturing this in the bioreactor, I was able to detect cells of which most were alive. And recently we trialed this by testing it in the bioreactor for seven days, where again, we, we were able to detect cells. We're going to continue reanalyzing the D and recellularized tissues using routine histology, biochemical analyses, and immunofluorescence. But the question that remains is why are these findings initially important for us to know? First is that being able to create a small animal model will help facilitate more um, understanding of D and recellularization and complex tissues. 
We established a detergent protocol for decelerization that uses a less concentrated amount than typically used, suggesting a less toxic approach. And third, this is establishing a foundation of how we can take this bioengineering technique and establish this for VC transplants and potentially find a way to reduce the need for anti-rejection drugs. Thank you for listening. Do we have any questions? Hi, uh, Nick, Nick Murphy, sorry. What would be the next stage in your uh, research? What's the next step after, after For this, this project? Yeah. Sure. Um, so right now we tested this with just repopulating with cells only um, to really see the proof of concept. Are we able to add cells and maintain cells in a scaffold that's been removed of it? Um, so even though we're seeing promising results, the next step would be to work on functionality. So one option that I'm starting some work on is employing electrical stimulation. Um, as part of the recellerization process. So for example, muscle cells, they can actually be triggered to differentiate into mature cells if you allow electrical stimulation um, or uh, like in a in vitro or in vivo environment. And so we're going to attempt this as a ex vivo uh, option. The other way to do this is to maybe extend this up to a pig model. Hi there. Question, what do you think is going to be the biggest challenge moving forward with this new technique? Um, it's having to do with the repopulation. First of all, we're talking about a complex tissue. It has multiple tissues in one in one tissue. So you're working with all different types that have different densities, architectures. So being able to repopulate with specific cell types that can target each one, that's one challenge. The second is the functionality. For tissues like your muscle, nerve, or um, bone, these all require more complex um, reconstruction or regenerative processes where you can replicate the function itself. So for example, the muscle being able to re reintegrate the nerve to allow that ner muscle to function, um, those are po um, possible areas of greater challenge. Yeah, okay, thank you. Given the time constraint, we'll be moving on. So for our next presenter, Jorge Castillo, who is a master's student in regenerative medicine at the University of Toronto, who will be presenting on the topic of developing an ex vivo organ perfusion system to model kidney disease. Welcome. My name is Jorge, and in my graduate studies, I've been working on developing a system uh, that could bring up new solutions for patients with chronic kidney disease, and that is maintaining a live kidney ex vivo for seven days. Can you imagine what it's like to live for the rest of your life needing a machine or an exogenous treatment to get rid of waste products from your body? Or even worse, knowing that your life expectancy with this condition will only be of about five of uh, to 10 years. This is what patients with chronic kidney disease uh, battle every day. And this actually affects 10% of the world's population. Therefore, we know that we need to increase our understanding of this devastating disease so that we can replicate it uh, and find new drug targets and also develop new therapies. However, despite the usefulness of current animal models, they can be expensive, time consuming, and also uh, laborious to work with. Therefore, in my laboratory, we asked ourselves, uh, can, we, can we develop a system that allows us to study uh, chronic kidney disease in, in a way that is uh, efficient in real time and also user-friendly? In this quest, we learned about ex vivo organ perfusion and its potential to maintain a kidney alive outside of the organism and how we could use this as a research platform to study uh, kidney disease. In this quest, uh, we designed and built the bioreactor system. And as we worked on it, we had to consider three main aspects. We wanted to ensure enough oxygenation of the culture medium 
by using atmospheric air only and avoid the use of external oxygenators. Second, we want to ensure enough nutrient delivery to a whole organ. And third, while considering these two uh, main requirements, we wanted to make it small, replicable, and of low cost. And so we designed this chamber that you can see in the middle, and uh, which is no taller than a medium cup of coffee. And uh, we were and it successfully met our expectations by allowing us to grow a mouse kidney uh, ex vivo for seven days. And we, we found that it oxygenated the medium going into the kidney very well. It, the, it, the kidneys that we grew in it uh, sh showed a fun function by filtering out and reabsorbing proteins and glucose from the urine that they made. And we also found normal morphology and protein expression from histological sections of these kidneys. We're very excited about the performance of our bioreactor and its potential for scaling up for high throughput results. We intend to now use the system for modeling disease and even regenerate um, complete mouse uh, kidney by using decellularization and recellularization. And with all the knowledge that we gain from this, from this model, we hope, we hope to help those patients that are right now battling chronic kidney disease. Thank you. We now have two minutes for questions. Does anyone have any questions? Um, part of a kidney disease they, is that it can take uh, a number of days to develop. And therefore we wanna Try to extend the culture conditions as long as possible. And right now, what I'm what I've shown you guys is the results that we have gotten up to seven days. And so, uh, even as future uh, directions for our project is to extend those conditions so that we can better um, that we can have enough time of culture so that we can uh, reproduce kidney disease in our in our ex vivo kidneys. If that makes sense. So, if no one else has any questions, I've got one for you. Sure. So. Yeah, um, so your system uses atmospheric as well as what, like the environment to control the kidney. How do you propose to replicate the human biology of interacting immune cells or other cells in the system? Yep. So uh, this is one of the uh, in the way we can we see it is actually one of the advantages of our system that we can isolate a kidney and study the kidney in isolation so that we don't have a uh, any of outside uh, influences on in our kidney and how and how that could um, affect the, the the development of kidney disease. And then at the same time, we know that in a bioreactor we can add one by one each of these components, like you're mentioning, that we can add immune cells or a particular component that will affect how our kidney grows in, in our bioreactor. All right, thank you. Thank you so much. So for our next presenter, Hyun Yoon Kim, who is a PhD student from the University of Montreal, who will be presenting on the topic of autophagy inhibiting inhibition aggravates ischemia reperfusion in injury, induced macrovascular injury. So welcome. Ischemia reperfusion injury is an unavoidable event during the kidney transplant, and blood supply toward the kidney is temporarily blocked until the kidney transplant. The, the donor kidney, uh, therefore, the donor kidney is exposed to the stress conditions such as low oxygen and low nutrients. Cell survivor signaling pathway, autophagy, is activated in the stressed cell. When the donor kidney is transplanted, the kidney receives fresh blood from the recipient. However, the donor kidney blood vessels are damaged. Particularly, renal micro, micro vessels are prone to damage after transplant, transplant. We call these tiny blood vessels renal pedicular capillaries. It has a low population in the kidney, but it support and cover the most stressed region of the kidney. However, 
the underlying mechanisms in the renal peritoneal capillary post ischemia reperfusion injury is not fully understood. The limited, the limited technical approach makes it more difficult. Autophagy is a cell survival signaling pathway, and it maintains balance with the apoptosis. This means that impaired autophagy will lead to the activation of apoptosis. Thus, we hypothesize that autophagy inhibition aggravates the ischemia reperfusion injury induced microvascular injury. In this study, we used the mice lenar ischemia reperfusion injury model. Firstly, we assessed the autophagy activation in lenar peritubular capillary post ischemia reperfusion injury. As you see here, autophagy is activated in the lenar peritubular capillary post ischemia reperfusion injury. After that, we inject uh, chloroquine as an autophagy inhibitor. As you see here, chloroquine increased microvascular layer functions and it worsens the lenar, fibro lenar fibrosis in peritubular capillaries. In conclusion, ischemia reperfusion injury induces autophagy activation in peritubular capillary endothelial cell, and uh, autophagy inhibition increases microvascular injury and worsens lenar fibrosis post ischemia reperfusion injury. Uh, I believe that our study could help, the, help define the novel strategy to protect the blood vessel uh, during the kidney transplant. Thank you for the listening to that. Do you have any questions? Could your theory also work on another organ or simply the kidney? Uh, uh, yes, uh, actually, uh, uh, I'm not sure about the other organ, organ, but if there is a microvasculature such as a peritoneal capillary like here, then maybe I think same things are applied to the, uh, the uh, apply to the same, apply, I think so. <laughs> Thank you. And for our next speaker, Christine Waddell, who is a PhD candidate in immunology at the University of British Columbia. She will be presenting on trigocytosis assay, a blood-based assay to detect allo-reactive immune cells. So let's welcome. Great, thanks. All right. So uh, this work is actually funded in part by the CDTRP. So it's really exciting to get to talk about it today. So we know that when a patient receives a transplant, almost immediately, their immune system is going to recognize it as foreign and try to kill it, which is good. That's what the immune system is trained to do, except in this situation. And so these patients will go on likely a lifelong immune, immunosuppression regimen. And although this will help hopefully to preserve their transplant's health, it will also put them at a higher risk of developing infections and cancers. And so it is the job of the managing physician to lower the um, amount of immunosuppression that they're on as much as they can to give them their best chance at a, a healthy life. However, at this point in time, it's really hard uh, to get information on how the health of your transplant is doing and how many alloreactive immune cells are in your body and whether they're creating um, a problem or not. And so we're working on developing a assay to give more information. It's based on this immunological concept of trogocytosis, where essentially an immune cell that recognizes a protein and forms a really strong bond with that protein will rip it right out of the membrane on which it was uh, expressed and reintegrate it as a part of its own membrane. And so if we look at this in the context of transplantation, we believe that say you have an alloreactive T cell um, so in yellow, if it recognizes an allo HLA, so that HLA protein that comes from the donor and is the massive driver of the allo reactive immune response, 
we think that those alloreactive T cells are going to snatch up that allo HLA protein and express it on their own membrane, essentially flagging themselves as alloreactive. And so we hope to quantify uh, these cells in the blood of patients who have received transplants. So what we do is we take these immune cells from the blood of our transplant recipients, and we co-culture them with cells that have been engineered to express the donor HLA attached to a fluorescent protein. And then 24 hours later, we can look for those immune cells and see whether they now express that fluorescent protein, suggesting that they stole the donor protein and that they are alloreactive. And so you can see in the video, the blue cell um, that's interacting with the big engineered cell, it has little pockets of red on its membrane. And that's showing us little pockets of that donor HLA that it has stolen. And we can quantify these cells. Um, the histogram on the right in red, we can see that when we use um, just like a control cell um, that we've optimized this assay around, it really becomes fluorescent for this protein. And so we've optimized the assay and now we're uh, trying to validate it in uh, patients who have received kidney transplants that are HLA mismatched. So we have two minutes for questions. Can can you comment on, on what you think the biochemistry of the membrane ripping is? Is it, is it an active process similar to like um, where you get, I guess, endocytosis or, or, or fusion that way? Or is it really just physical ripping where you have loose kind of like ends with a hydrophobic interior that's exposed to the hydrophilic kind of like environment, which would be biochemically kind of like um, stressful? Yeah, so I think that from what I've seen and, and people who have tried to go into drogocytosis, a lot of the proteins that seem to be involved are those involved in um, like just cell structure, actin, stuff like that. And it seems to be very similar with things like phagocytosis, transcytosis, like many things. So my impression is that if you just form a, a strong enough of a physical interaction, then when you separate, you're going to take a little bit of, of the membrane with you. But then the question about whether it gets re-expressed or degraded in an enzyme, I, enzyme, um, I think that maybe has to do like with when the protein gets into the cell. My hypothesis is, is there's something more there, but when it just steals it, I think it's just physical. Just a quick one. So what happens to the cell that uh, donated its membrane? It, well, we we show um, not so much in this assay because it's an artificial system, but um, T regs because we're a T reg lab, uh, they do this a lot. And so, um, especially in the context of like a T reg interacting with an antigen presenting cell, um, they can deplete important proteins on the antigen presenting cell that would otherwise activate other T cells. And so that's like a way T regs are able to suppress. Um, T cells. So you can, in some in some situations, deplete um, the the protein that you're stealing away. And and there's models where uh, this is relevant in, in cancer therapies. And T cells are like CAR T cells start stealing their own target and then killing each other by fratricide. And it becomes really messy and it makes a uh, flow questionable. <laughs> okay. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you. So let's welcome our next speaker, Mawal Sadat who is a master's student in physiology at the University of Toronto, who will be presenting a normothermic ex vivo perfusion of the murine pancreas to model type 1 diabetes. I want you to imagine waking up one day and you feel different. You feel irritable, unusually thirsty, extremely fatigued, and really hungry, even though you just had a big meal. Next, you find out that the only way to control this is to start injecting yourself multiple times a day with a specific drug. Now, that was just a few seconds of your time, but imagine you lived every single day like this, from childhood to an old age. Well, sadly, that's the reality for little Timmy up here, along with the 9 million other people who live with what is called type 1 diabetes. Type 1 diabetes is a disease involving autoimmune destruction of pancreatic beta cells, whose job it is to regulate blood sugar levels by releasing insulin. Thankfully, in 1921, 
insulin therapy was invented, but this only helps alleviate the symptoms. And unfortunately, we're still hunting for a cure for this disease. Since then, we've learned a lot more about type 1 diabetes, but a lot still remains unknown about the pathophysiology and the progression of the disease. And for that, good disease models are needed. In science, we know that there are in vitro cell cultures, which can be oversimplified because you really only have specific cell types mixed together in a dish. On the other hand, we have in vivo models in mice, for example, but those can be overly complex because you have to deal with the whole organism. But what if we could do something in between? What if we could study the organ of interest, for example, the pancreas, in an isolated way with no distractions from the rest of the body? Well, that's exactly what I'm doing in my project. So in our lab, we've generated a normothermic ex vivo organ perfusion system for mouse organs that are capable of keeping the, uh, the organ healthy and functioning by perfusing it with a specific cocktail of nutrients um, that keep it healthy. So how do I do this? Well, first I isolate the pancreas and then I cannulate the artery and use that to hook it up to our ex vivo perfusion machine and start perfusing it with the specific uh, media that we created. And so we first, we look at structure and we also look at function by doing a glucose stimulated insulin secretion test. And so far we've been able to show that we can keep the pancreas healthy and functioning for up to four days in our system. Then more recently, we tried to create a model of type one diabetes in the ex vivo, uh, in the ex vivo pancreas, and we did this by using a substance called streptozotocin. And we were able to show that we can uh, generate beta cell specific cell death in the isolated pancreas just after 48 hours of treatment. So overall, this model provides us with a novel way to study the pathophysiology and progression of type 1 diabetes. And importantly, it can be used to test the effects of various uh, therapeutic agents in really an unlimited way. And it can be translated to human organs so we can help people like Tammy up here, as well as the millions of others, live a better diabetes-free life. Thank you. So uh, could you explain how this model would be um, better than um, pancreatic, uh, highly pancreatic cell culture, for example? which will be much more simple to produce. Mm -hmm. So with islets or cell cultures, we find that you, know, you only have those specific cell types in a dish, but we know that there is actually crosstalk between islets and other cell types of the pancreas in diabetes. Um, and a lot of like studies have shown that recently. And so we find that it's really important to be able to see the effects of all of those different cell types working together um, to cause type one diabetes. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Let's welcome our next speaker, Samrat Ray, who is a liver transplant surgeon and postdoctoral fellow at the Toronto General Hospital, who will be presenting on expanding the donor pool using no normothermic ex vivo machine perfusion model in pancreas transplantation. Uh, very good evening, everyone. Uh, I would like to, at the very beginning, thank my preceding speaker for making my job actually easy because uh, I'll be just, it's, my talk is going to be an expansion of what she has already spoken about, but in a bigger model, that is not the murine one, we have, I'll be talking in porcine and in the discarded human grafts. So the aim of the study will be it was to assess the ex expanding the donor pool of pancreas transplantation using the normothermic ex vivo machine perfusion uh, model in pancreas transplantation. So as we know that pancreas transplantation is the final uh, word when it comes to end stage diabetes mellitus, but it has not been easy so far. And the reason being the extreme fragility of the organ uh, in terms of its pre precarious vascular anatomy and also the fact that it's very sensitive to develop a tissue injury and edema. So with that uh, premise, it has been seen that the pancreas grafts have a very high rate of discard. As per a latest study by the UK registry, it has been shown that the discard rate, the utilization rate is just 9%. So that brought us to the thought that we could apply normothermic ex vivo pancreas perfusion to see whether the grafts could be utilized or not. 
So this is the normothermic exvivo uh, pancreas perfusion circuit that we use, which comprises of an organ chamber, which ensures normothermia, an inflow and an outflow system, and basically a replication of the neonatal S3 bypass cardiopulmonary circuit that we usually use in the clinical setting, and also comprising of a dialysis cassette, which comprises of the hemodialysis filter, and this all uh, forms the normothermic ex vivo pancreas perfusion circuit. So using this circuit, we tried to uh, do survival model in the porcine uh, grafts, wherein from the donor uh, pig, we extracted the pancreas, the donor pancreatectomy was done. It was subjected to two hours of cold storage, after which three hours of uh, normothermic perfusion using the circuit that has been shown here, and subsequently allotransplanted in the recipient pig who has been pancreat pancreatectomized, and three-day survival, survival model being followed. Similarly, in discarded human grafts also, we were uh, we attempted to do the same thing, uh, wherein we uh, tried to put the pancreas in the chamber for four hours and tried to assess the various biochemical markers in the perfusate. So with this, the, if I would like to summarize my results in the porcine survival models, if you see on the, on the left side of the picture, this is the graft how we started off. And on the right side, this is the graft that we could achieve by a series of uh, hit and trial on 12 experiments in the non-survival models. After which, when we translated the same into the survival models, we could see that we could achieve a stable level of amylase, which is a, a surrogate marker of tissue injury, and also a very stable level of glucose tolerance test on the day of sacrifice, which showed that the graft was functioning well in these models. So in the discarded human pancreas grafts as well, if you see the pancreas graft, this is how it appears on table, and this is the microscopic appearance. And similarly, the results of the amylase and the endocrine markers in the form of C-peptide and insulin could be translated. So in conclusion, normothermic ex vivo pancreas perfusion is feasible in porcine and the human and the discarded human pancreatic graft models. However, optimizing the perfusion milieu and also targeting the various mediators of inflammation could be future directions for us so that we can translate it into the clinical setting and address the issue of shortage of grafts in future. Thank you, and I would like to invite any questions. Hi there. As Hi. somebody who knows uh, very limited about transplants, why do I have to put the organ in this system and not just directly in a person or a pig? So uh, this is how it started off. We could directly put it in the pig, but the very idea of normothermic perfusion was to just optimize the graft. It is not for a perfect graft. It is, in fact, for expanding the donor pool, the grafts which are usually clinically discarded based on the fact that it can have a prolonged cold ischemia time or a prolonged warm ischemia doesn't look that great uh, for a transplant surgeon to just right away accept it. So that way, if we subject it to the normothermic perfusion, we, we are aiming to optimize the graft so that eventually that discarded graft could be used for transplantation. That's the final goal of the entire premise of normothermic perfusion. Thank you. Do you have any concerns uh, in terms of edema forming in your perfused organ? Because you're perfusing it, I guess, at a particular uh, flow rate, right? Yes, we did. And if you see in, the, in one of the slides, I showed that when we started off, the graft looked horrible. There was like complete hemorrhage and edema and like huge amount of tissue injury. So we altered the physicochemical components of the perfusate and the dialysate by simple measures like altering the amount of salt or the concentration of carbon dioxide in the perfusate and even altering the flow rate. We keep a very low flow rate because the graft is subjected to, uh, like it's very sensitive to like high, high flow rates and thereby tissue injury. And by these hidden trials, we finally could achieve a more respectable looking graft. And therefore, we translated the same into the survival models. And, uh, just so, did you did you reduce some of these components, or do you found do you found that do you increase them as well? Or? We increased the salt concentration, and we found that higher salt actually helps. And we increased the carbon dioxide also, which is probably because of the anti-inflammatory and the vasodilator properties of the carbon dioxide. Perhaps, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. That was an exciting talk, so we can maybe have a conversation later. We'll be keeping the time limit to three minutes strictly moving forward. So let's welcome our next speaker, Iman Kasi, who is a PhD student in nephrology at the CHUM Research Center, and who will be presenting on apoptotic exosome-like vesicles mediating immune response, dysregulation, and kidney dysfunction following ischemia reperfusion injury. So let's welcome Iman.
So hello everyone, my name is Iman Kesti and uh, I'll be talking to you about an immunological mechanism causing kidney graft damage uh, independent of donor and recipient compatibility. So kidneys have abundant blood vessels and during transplantation, there are periods where no blood goes to the kidney. And that's what we call an ischemia. So cells of blood vessels will die and more importantly, with an old age. Our research team has discovered that those dying cells will release small pieces of them in the blood that we named apoizo. And these apoizo can induce the immune system to produce autoantibodies. Those antibodies are normally here to help clear dead cells. But in this context, they unfortunately attack the graft. So now we study how apoizo alter the immune response causing this kidney graft rejection. So to do so, we uh, used old and young, we took old and young mice, we removed one of their kidneys and we caused ischemia to the remaining one to mimic what the transplantation procedure is causing in patients. So we found that there was more apoixo released in the blood of old mice, which caused more autoantibodies to be produced. We also found that there was more white blood cells attacking the uh, kidney of old mice, and we actually see them blue under microscope, and we see we have many blue particles or cells in this damaged kidney on the left compared to a pretty normal one. And finally, this resulted in more kidney damage, scars, and a reduced kidney function in old mice. Then we asked whether apoixo are the guilty ones. So we took those young mice with a damaged kidney, and we injected apoixo in their blood, to make them have a, a level of apoixo in the blood comparable to what we saw in old mice. And interestingly, we made that damage in young mice as worse as what we saw in old mice. So to conclude, an old or a repeatedly damaged kidney will release more apoixo in the blood that can alert the immune system to attack that kidney back. So understanding this mechanism will help us identify markers to assess donor's kidney and its function once transplanted, and more importantly, therapeutic targets to paint it either apoixo themselves or the immune response to them to better preserve donor's kidney and make it last longer uh, in recipients. So I'll end with my acknowledgements to people behind this work, our funding agencies, CDTIP for this opportunity, and all of you for your attention. Thank you. Hi there. Um, in this case, it seems like you're using the exosomes as um, a way to figure out if the kidney is healthy or not. Could you use it in the opposite sense and as a biomarker? Yes. So uh, that will be uh, one of the, uh, what well, we are looking at, uh, we found that apoix who are aggravating this damage when we inject them in young mice with only an ischemia or perfusion injury that they don't have that much damage as we saw in old mice, we inject them, we are worsening that damage. So they could be also used as um, indicators, as either maybe diagnostic or prognosis markers to have an idea on the donor's kidney, uh, looking for example at the release in the perfusion liquid, or even after transplantation, looking, assessing the, the amount of apoixo that are circulating in the blood and having an idea on how much that kidney is uh, maybe working or the kidney function is after transplantation. Yeah, thank you. That will be a less invasive way to, to assess the kidney after transplantation. Hello, thank you for your talk. Um, in regards to APRIG, so I was wondering, is it mainly produced during the storage uh, uh, duration? Because when we have implant, or do you detect it after you've already transplanted it into the donor? Because, you know, transplantation, if there is a rejection, it could also be partially due to incompatibility from the donor side as well. Yeah, that's actually uh, the model we're using here is not a transplantation model. That's a, uh, a model with a pure autoimmune response. So we have a, um, a renal ischemia perfusion injury model. Mm -hmm. um, so could you just repeat the first part of the question? So when you are storing it, like when do you actually measure the... Um, 
Apoix. Okay. Yeah, as I said, that's not a transplantation model. So we induce the ischemia or perfusion injury in this mice. And then after three weeks, 21 days, which correspond to the phase where we have a transition from an acute to a chronic kidney injury. So we assess that level of apoixo in the blood, the level of apoixo that are circulating in the oh, blood. Okay. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Now, I just want to thank our speakers for this first session. Uh, excellent presentations overall so far. So to our attendees, please remember to evaluate all of our wonderful presenters. And so our first presentation for the second part is Suni Yang, who is an experimental medicine graduate student who will be presenting on gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria, surface con constituents, uh, hindering kidney cell viability in vitro. Hi everyone, my name is Sunny. Thank you for coming here today to listen to my research about the microbiome and um, its influence on kidney viability. Understanding the interactions between microbes and tissue is vitally crucial given the growing importance of the, urine, of the microbiome. Lipopolysaccharide LPS are abundant gram-negative Gram negative uh, surface membrane components known to trigger strong innate immunity, while LTA, lipothetoic acid, has been argued to be the functional equivalent in gram positive bacteria. The effects of these bacteria components on kidney cells are undefined, although emerging results argue for their relevance in kidney health and disease. These, this study aims to provide deeper insight on this topic by assessing kidney cell viability when introduced to varying concentrations of LPS and LTA. In vitro models using two kidney cell lines, human missing gill cells, which is known as THMC, and human proximal tubular cells, HKCA, were cultured in vivo with LPS from Asterisa coli and LTA from Staphylococcus aureus in varying concentrations shown in the top right table for 48 hours. Flow cytometry followed by mitochondria assay using MTT uptake and reduction was performed to assess cell apoptosis and metabolic activity respect respectively. So for the results, we see absorbance rate from the metabolic uh, trials as shown in the bottom left table and visualized in the bottom um, right graph. So flow cytometry showed no significant difference uh, in cell death and was not included for this short presentation. Based on literature, it may be that bacteria surface constituents function to stimulate cellular systems but are not virulent enough to cause um, cellular distress triggering apoptosis. When looking at metabolic changes, LPS and LTA resulted in similar declines in activity. When comparing the two under the same concentration, LPS resulted in greater declines in absorbance rate in both cell lines, indicative of a stronger stimulatory effect. Interestingly, we found combining gram-positive and negative gram, um, bacteria constituents led to a decline in stimulatory effects and higher metabolic rates close to control. So there seems to be some sort of modulatory effects um, when the two compounds are together. Finally, we found that tubular cells readings fluctuated more compared to mesangial, which is reflective of a higher degree of sensitivity to the treatment. Mesangial cells have been found to exhibit fibroblast characteristics, which may potentially make them more robust and resistant to inflammation. So based on our observations, we can conclude that gram-negative and gram-positive bacteria constituents show significant stimulatory effects on kidney cell viability, with gram-negative from E. coli causing a stronger stimulatory effect than gram-positive from uh, Staphylococcus aureus. Bacteria species may modulate one another via a competitive influence which supports the emergent argument for a protective functions uh, of a diverse microbiome on human health. And finally, we found that tubular cells showed higher sensitivity than mesangial cells, which may be attributed to their different anatomy. With a stronger understanding of how these membrane constituents interact on a cellular basis, our findings bring forth increased potential for the role of bacteria components in therapeutics regulating kidney health and disease. To build on these findings, we are now assessing the inflammatory responses to these interactions starting from a genomic level. Thank you for listening. Sorry to take one minute to walk to the mic. Um, very interesting presentation. Have you looked at the differential expression of TLRs or do you know 
about TLR expression in mesangial versus tubular cells that could explain the differential response? Uh, actually, I've done a lot of research on the TLR pathways for um, between LPS and LTA mm -hmm. because LPS is found in almost all gram-negative um, bacteria and LTA in all gram-positive. So LPS functions by really attacking the TLR, uh, TLR4, mm -hmm. uh, whereas LTA um, can do for TLR4 and 2. Mm -hmm. um, so overall, the pathway is very similar, which is also why I believe they have like a competitive interference with each other. I think you may have answered my question, but as somebody who doesn't know much about the microbiome, why did you choose those two bacteria? Um, so because right now the microbiome has been, is quite novel. And over the past decade, a lot of research has come up over its inf uh, influence on kidney uh, infections, kidney health, and so on. However, so far, research has just been very generalized, and it's just been that there is a change in diversity. There is a decrease in diversity um, between pre- and post-transplant, between uh, chronic kidney disease and healthy patients. So right now we're really trying to dissect that huge sector of like looking, dwelling into individual species and seeing how they actually interact. Because otherwise all we know is there's just a change in diversity, which is why um, to categorize, I started by looking at the generalized um, main pathways of how these bacteria interact, which is through their membrane uh, constituents. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So for our next speaker, Maud Lanoy, who is a master's student in molecular biology at the University of Montreal, will be presenting on apoptotic exosome-like vesicles, transforming bioactive uh, mRNA to endothelial cells via phosphorylate SU-independent microphenocytosis. <laughs> Graft survival is an important issue in renal transplantation. When kidney lack blood supply during this procedure, small vessels which bring oxygen and nutrients, the kidney become injured. Previous work done by Dr. Eber's lab identified a novel subcategory of extracellular vesicles called apoptotic exosome-like, commonly called apoexo, that are released in the circulation when kidney lack oxygen. These fragments can induce an immune response and a modification of the blood vessel environment, which could affect the transition from acute kidney injury to the loss of the kidney transplant. Here, we explore the mechanism by which endothelial cells can internalize apoexo and whether or not they can deliver functional mRNA to endothelial cells. In our context, we can compare endothelial cells to a postman, the extracellular vesicles to a letter, and the reception cells to the mailbox. Normally, the postman would deliver the letter in a slot of the mailbox. However, the specific letter that is apoexo can enter to this normal pathway. In fact, we observe that apoexo can have a different content Indeed, we observe a specific mRNA profile and observe that PCSK5, a protein convertase, uh, is highly expressed in the apoexo. We also observe specific stru uh, structure at the surface of the mailbox. With electron microscopy on endothelial cells, we observe lamellipodia-like structure, which are like grown little arms, uh, and uh, which are typical to microbinostosis. After the discovery, we use inhibitor of micropinostosis to block this special way of entry and observe a major reduction of apoexus uptake by endothelial cells. We also demonstrate that phosphatidylserine expressed on the surface of the apoexo is a key element controlling their uptake. Blocking phosphatidylserine reduces the uptake by endothelial cells. Our last step was to look at the transfer of mRNA. We wanted to know if the content of the letter was destroyed or not once in the mailbox. To do so, we look at PCSK5 mRNA expression in endothelial cells treated with apoexo and observe an augmentation in this condition. But when we block microbinostosis, we observe a reduced uh, PCSK5 mRNA. All of these uh, results demonstrate that endothelial cells can actively internalized apoexo through phosphatidylserine-dependent microbinostosis. 
knowing that aqua exo cargo is specific set of nucleic acid, the study of how those functional mRNA, like PCSK5, could modulate the endothelial function, could lead to new avenues pr for preventing apoexo internalization and endothelial dysfunction. Thank you very much. We have two minutes for questions. That is well, interesting. Uh, do you know how the RNA gets out of uh, into the cyto? Does it get into the cytoplasm? Uh, and how? Yeah. Like, it, it, does it go? Does it get to the lysosome? And in this lysosome, is it going to do the endothelial cells express like TLR, what three, seven, and eight, or something like that? And, uh, and do you mean if uh, apoxo express these? Uh, no, I guess the first is the, is the RNA getting into the cytosol. Uh, uh... Yeah, but for example, when we look at PCSK5, uh, there's two types of PCSK5, and there's one that uh, will stay, for example, in the membrane, but the one we're looking at and, and, and uh, all those will go into the apoison and can be transferred. So there's some that probably will be in the side those all, but there's some also that will be tr uh, transferred to the uh, reception cell. Okay. Since every cell kind of produces its own exosomes, how what surface markers are you using to identify it to know that you're isolating the correct one? Uh, yeah, so apoexo uh, differ from exosome mm -hmm. in a different uh, way. First of all, it's uh, the way that they are produced. So apoexo are uh, uh, the, well are delivered in the cascade tree downstream activation. So when uh, cell go undergo apoptosis, which is not the case for our normal exosome. So this is the major um, difference. And also apoexo express specific marker has a, the uh, 20S proteasome, which is not expressed in the exosome and uh, also SG3 too. So it, they have markers that are specific to this uh, extracellular vesicles. Thank you. So for our next speaker, Ruhi Malayala, who is an MD candidate at the University of British Columbia, who will be presenting on determination of blood pressure targets for goal-directed anesthesia in renal transplant. Hi everyone, my name is Ravit. I'm here today to present some work out of UBC's Department of Urologic Sciences supervised by Dr. Chris Kwan. Our work is uh, all about what a patient's blood pressure should be during a kidney transplant surgery. To give some background, and this is probably of no surprise to anybody here, uh, a donor kidney is a pretty vulnerable thing. When you disconnect its original blood supply, it's continually sustaining damage. And once you reconnect it to the recipients, uh, a good initial blood pressure can make a really big difference uh, to the health of this uh, new kidney. But the thing is, is that blood pressure in surgery can be pretty labile. So the question is, what pressure should we be targeting? Um, to investigate this, we gathered three main pieces of data. For about 450 patients, we charted out each patient's mean arterial blood pressures throughout their surgery. And we also have the time when the surgeons finished uh, connecting up the blood supply. Uh, this is called anastomosis, and I point this out because the donated kidney is actually only really seeing the blood pressures after the gray box in the graph above, after the anastomosis. The second thing we got is uh, whether vasopressor drugs were used in a patient's surgery. Those are drugs that increase the mean arterial pressure. And then the last thing we got is our outcome for each patient, DGF or delayed graft function. That's when a patient's kidney doesn't work and they need dialysis within a week of the transplant. To start discussing our results, we took a look at whether the average MAP after anastomosis for each surgery increased the risk of DGF. So look at graph A, that's um, average MAP is on the x-axis, DGF incidence is on the y-axis. You'll notice that we uh, uh, subdivided the analysis between DCDs, which is donation after cardiac death, and NDDs, donation after neurologically determined death. Um, DCD kidneys tend to have more DGF, so it's important to split them. And we see that for DCD kidneys, 
that had a lower map, uh, their DGF rate just goes up and up and up. But NDDs, that curve is pretty flat. So NDDs are pretty resistant to that danger of hypotension. Um, interestingly, at maps of like around 85 to 90, uh, DGF rates for DCDs are pretty similar to NDDs. Our second analysis is pretty similar. It's a logistic regression of the lowest map of uh, post anastomosis on the X axis versus DGF incidence on the Y axis in both DCDs on the left and NDDs on the right. But we also took a look at how the risk curve changes when you look at people who received presser drugs. So those are the people in blue versus people who didn't receive a presser in black. And the intersection of the risk curves is the interesting part. So the trend is that uh, if the pressers are used when the lowest map is below 60, 65 ish, the DGF rate is lower compared to the black baseline. And that makes sense because responding to hypotension with a presser is a good thing. <laughs> But if you use the pressors too liberally or too early, let's say above uh, a map of 70 to 75, that uh, the pressors might actually increase the DGF rates compared to baseline. So there may be a bit of a sweet spot for pressors. So overall, we've generated some interesting hypotheses about map targets. And if we can test these hypotheses, uh, hopefully one day we can optimize anesthesia protocols and transplant. We can move one step closer to getting the most benefit out of every kidney. Thank you. We have two minutes for questions. Great work. Um, what's the link between having, I guess, a higher uh, blood pressure and the uh, graft function? Um, our group's thinking is that if you overuse uh, vasopressors, uh, you can cause like a vasoconstrictive effect in the renal vasculature. And that would actually, like, you know, although you're getting the blood pressure higher, it's not actually increasing like nutrients and oxygen delivery to the kidney. That's that's our idea. Like that's why we're thinking that higher blood pressure uh, created with pressors might actually be bad. But just higher blood pressure in general might be a good thing for the kidney if, if that higher blood pressure actually represents increased perfusion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. In your opinion, what would be the worst mean arterial pressure, and what would happen clinically? Zero is the mean, worst mean arterial. Okay, no, pressure. you have to have a number. <laughs> oh, um, not ten. Sure. Okay. <laughs> I mean, it's it's still a hard question if it's not zero. Like when you say worst, I, basically the target that I think is a good thing to approach based on this retrospective data is something in the range of uh, seventy-five to eighty-five. But anything below that is, especially in DCDs, that's those are the more susceptible kidneys, and it's say like those are like the worst maps to have. Thank you. So just for, yes, of course. Okay, thank you. So our next speakers will be joining us online. Emmanuel uh, Nogoya, who is a master's student in transplantation in Brazil, who will be presenting on the use of pancaspase inhibitor during normal thermic ex vivo lung perfusion, a strategy to reduce ischemia reperfusion injury in pig liver grafts. Thank you. Hey, Emmanuel, are you joining us right now? Can you, uh, we haven't heard from you. Perhaps you can unmute yourself. So our next speaker who will be joining us virtually will be Nadia Prenito who is a postdoctoral research fellow at the University Health Network, who will be presenting on transcriptomic uh, changes in liver transplant recipient with non-alcoholic staphylohepatitis indicated dysregulation of wound healing. Hello, everyone. Um, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, perfect, thank you. 
Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, so before I begin, I'd like to present my acknowledgement, and that is to the entire lab of Dr. Mamita Bat at Eva Chen, as well as to Yuri Ryman um, and Diogo Pellegrina, so uh, our collaborators on this uh, project, and Shankri Su, who is uh, working at the MOT Biobank, who's been pivotal in us getting um, our transplant uh, liver biopsies. Click. So my focus of research is the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Um, and as the name suggests, this is a disease of the liver whereby um, accumulation of the fat leads to inflammation and then fibrosis and wound healing of the liver as well as cirrhosis. And down the road, um, when the patient cannot, um, when the liver of the patient um, fails, require liver transplantation. Click. So NAFLD itself um, can progress to NASH, which is non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, and this is the inflammatory form of the disease. So both NAFLD and NASH can present fibrosis, and they do so at different rates. NAFLD fibrosis pr uh, progresses at one stage every 14 years, whereas NASH fibrosis progresses at one stage every seven years. Um, and so these, as you can see, um, are rather silent diseases, and patients who come to the clinic um, usually presenting, um, complaining of uh, pain, they're usually presenting the later stages of the disease, uh, whereby fibrosis already progressed pretty late. And the risk for the development of NAFLD as well as NASH um, are many of the metabolic disorders that we know of, such as cardiovascular diseases, kidney diseases, as well as type 2 diabetes. Next. And so, um, unfortunately, once these patients receive liver transplantation, it is not unheard of to see post-transplant NASH reoccurring. Um, and post-transplant NASH can also occur de novo uh, in patients who are uh, transplanted for other indications. And the risk for this is usually increased by the same comorbidities that I uh, mentioned earlier. And what is worse with post-transplant NASH is actually the fact that uh, the progression of this disease is much more rapid compared to the non-transplant NASH, whereby uh, in up to 40% of the patients, uh, stage three fibrosis can be seen within five years post-liver transplant. Next. And so our lab basically wanted to uh, answer the simplest question, which is what causes exactly the accelerated progression of post-liver transplant NASH? And so for this, click. Um, we identified several patients um, at our uh, transplant center who fit three different categories. Uh, that is post-transplant control. So uh, those who are um, so those who are receiving liver transplant but do not have tran post-transplant NASH. We have post-transplant cetosis as well as post-transplant NASH. And so basically these are patients who receive liver transplantation and then present post-transplant NASH. Um, whether de novo or recurrent. If you take a look at the age as well as the BMI across the different groups, it is roughly similar. And so these are uh, pretty similar groups, but they do differ in other characteristics as listed here. Next. And so upon identifying these patients, we basically collected uh, liver biopsies that were retrieved from the patients and were then uh, stored uh, frozen. So from these liver biopsies, we did a simple method of RNA sequencing where we wanted to basically answer the questions, what genes are regulated, what genes are dysregulated, and then identify the different pathways that are perturbed. Next. Yeah. And so we were able to identify um, wound healing as one of the pathways that are actually significantly perturbed. Next. And upon looking at the different protein-protein interactions um, that are significantly differentiated in this group, we identified many fibrosis markers, many liver aging markers, as well as many metabolic markers um, that seem to play a role in the progression of the disease. And so we believe that post-transplant NASH show dysregulated pathways that are um, basically involved in wound healing and fibrosis. And if we characterize these molecular changes further, we may be able to inform future directions of therapeutic avenue in post-transplant NASH patients. Thank you. Sorry, for those uh, who are evaluating, just put one 
for the previous presenter who, who wasn't able to present so you can access Nadia's uh, scoring criteria. Thanks. Hi there. Um, I have a question on the slide that's presented right now. On the right side, are you using an IPA program? Yes, we are using an IPA program. Uh, no, this is not an IPA program. This is from um, the program that our collaborator basically developed by himself. But I'm assuming it's similar. So my question remains, yeah. things that you're, the 10 protein-protein uh, interactions, is, is, is this like a hypothesis that you are assuming that these proteins will be the ones that you can use, or this is what you're actually testing? So we basically, based on the differential expressions of the genes that we found, we identified the interactions of the different proteins of these significantly dysregulated proteins, and then identified these as the key pathway, as the key proteins that are the nodes basically in this pathway. Okay. And you also mentioned earlier in um, this presentation that people come in with pain. Can you describe that? Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, so uh, my background is more in the molecular biology part, and so I'm not really... Um, familiar with all the clinical signs of a uh, pain of the liver, but I'm assuming that when people come to the to the clinic because of um, like an advanced NASH, that's what they would be feeling. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, we'll be sticking to the three minute time point. And so for our next speaker, Gobika Kunichi, who will be the final speaker for tonight who is a medical student at the University of West, uh, Western Ontario, and who will be presenting on deep learning to predict trajectories and identifying features associated with death and transplant in waitlisted NASH patients. So let's welcome. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, I would also like to thank my supervisor, Dr. Butt, as well as the team at UHN where this work was conducted. So non-alcoholic steatohepatitis is the second most common reason for liver transplant. On average, NASH patients are older and have more com comorbidities like diabetes. Unfortunately, the model for end-stage liver disease score is a worse predictor of waitlist mortality in NASH patients. They're more likely to die or deteriorate on the waitlist. However, their post-transplant survival is similar to other recipients. We were interested in forecasting NASH waitlist trajectory, but we wanted to leverage deep learning's ability to handle larger data sets with more variables. We also wanted to forecast trajectory in a competing risk scenario, where we consider the risk of death and transplant to mimic reality on the waitlist. We use data time of waitlisting on over 17,000 waitlisted NASH patients from the SRTR database. We constructed two traditional Cox proportional hazard models and two machine learning random survival force models with event-specific models of each type to predict death or transplant. We compared these models to Deep NASH, which is a deep learning model that we constructed that predicts death and transplant at the same time. We also created a new performance metric for competing risk models called the Competing Risk Coherence Index. This metric assesses how accurately a model predicts that an event has occurred based on the event that actually occurred at a given point in time. Next. While we found that the event-specific RSF model had the best discrimination calibration based on the C-index and Breyer scores, DeepNash performed better when evaluated using the Competing Risk Coherence Score. This means that this model more accurately predicts death and transplant in a competing risk scenario. We forecasted four patient trajectories on the waitlist for 60 months using data at time of waitlisting alone. In the top row, you can see that the RSF predictions for death and transplant are displayed. However, in these, although we display the predictions of each event on the same graph, these risks can't actually be compared because they're constructed from two separate event-specific models. Instead, in the bottom row, we have predictions using the deep NASH model. This model outputs predictions for both death and transplant in one model, so the relative risk of the, each event of death and transplant can be compared at a given point in time on the wait list. In deep NASH, the risk also varies over time because of the nonlinear relationship between covariates and outcomes. This discrete risk prediction can be done even with data from the time of waitlisting alone, as we've demonstrated here, and this may more accurately represent risk on the waitlist. Next. Using the permutation importance method in the deep NASH model, we found that for the prediction of death on the waitlist, MELVIT with waitlisting most impacted the C index, followed by INR, bilirubin, albumin, sodium, moderate functional status, and age at least listing. For the transplant event, we found that MELD was followed by several components of the MELD score, as well as blood type AB and ICU or hospitalization status. While the composite MELD score is most associated with death and transplant on the waitlist in the deep NASH model, its individual components are closely followed by other variables. 
In conclusion, Deep NASH can be used to leverage deep learning methodology to improve forecasting of weightless trajectory in NASH patients. And it can be also, also be used to identify variables that are associated with death or transplant, ultimately to optimize NASH outcomes on the waitlist. We would like to thank the Canadian Institutes for Health Research as well as the TKR EM Summer Student Program for their support. Thank you. And we now have two minutes for questions. Hi there, good presentation. Um, in your opinion, how reliable is your model? So um, when we look at the C index values, and I didn't display them here, uh, our model actually is comparable to the RSF model. So C index values were um, in the 0 0.85 range or above, um, but we did find they were slightly lower for deep NASH compared to um, the RSF and Cox proportional hazards, although all three models did predict um, NASH trajectory well on the wait list. Um, but uh, because C index and bar scores are not intended for use in competing risk models, uh, that's why we looked into constructing a score that's able to evaluate them. And we saw that when we look at the actual percent of time that Deep Nash can't predicts the outcome correctly, it was around 80% of the time, which is uh, higher than the Cox proportional hazard hazards model and the RSF model. However, with that being said, um, because these models are built off retrospective data, they obviously enhance um, biases that are already there. So if the current system um, and is already biased and there's already bias in the data, then um, the, the problem with using retrospective data is they have the ability to um, um, make uh, kind of carry forward these biases. Thank you, very good answer. All right, thank you. So that concludes our evening for today. We want to thank all our speakers and everyone for your thoughtful questions as well as your discussions.